The way that self-care is conceptualized is often this top-down approach. It's kind of this idea, I should take care of myself. Hmm, what does that mean? Oh, well, BuzzFeed says it means I should get a pedicure or <laughs> listen to music. And it's not necessarily connected with how you're actually feeling and what you're actually needing. On this episode of The Self-Care Mission, I welcome Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist based in Portland, Oregon. She came on to talk about all things self-care, but most specifically, this very interesting framework that she came up with to help us all think more specifically about the ways in which we can take care of ourselves. Let's get into the episode. Stephanie Wynn, welcome to the Self-Care Mission. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for being here. You are a licensed marriage and family therapist. Yes. That's incredible. And you've been doing that for quite a while. Um, I started in 2013 out of grad school. I've been licensed since 2016. And I actually just opened my private practice in June. Okay, based here in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, where except, we both are. But you can help people anywhere, right? Right. Yeah. I've been doing telehealth exclusively since March, which means I can help anyone in the state of Oregon. I don't even have to be here in Oregon to help people in the state of Oregon. I just have to be licensed here. Oh. So telehealth has broadened options for a lot of therapists. That's really cool. So I couldn't be more excited to talk to you because when I first sort of pivoted away from the massage therapy podcast I was doing and I wanted to start talking more exclusively about self-care, I started Googling all this like ideas around self-care and like pillars of self-care and self-care and uh, just different frameworks for it. And I happened upon a framework that you created and it was like far and away the most interesting one I saw. A lot of them were very like buzz clicky like clickbaity kind of <laughs> articles mm -hmm. and like magazine type spreads that mm -hmm. didn't really add up to anything and weren't really super helpful mm -hmm. and but but i had no idea that you actually lived in the same city as me mm. so it just really kind of worked out very nicely so mm -hmm. um we're definitely going to dive in to your six pillars of self-care which it's so much more than that it's like a whole matrix it's really great anyway so but before we get there how do you think about self-care for yourself? How do you show up for yourself on a daily basis? Mm, okay. Well, those are several questions. <laughs> I ask so many questions at um, once. Take them in any way sure. that you want to. So, I mean, I'll just start off with how I developed this resource. And I mean, it's serendipity that you found it because this isn't something that I even published online. It's really just a tool that I made at the last place I worked because I wanted to help my clients identify what self-care could look like in their life. And then I guess it ended up on a website somewhere at the University of Washington. I don't know how it got there. Then you found it. So here we are. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'll share that part of why I saw the need to develop this is, well, for many of the same reasons as you, I wasn't satisfied with how self-care was being defined. I was actually rather annoyed by the phrase because I think it's thrown around a lot. It's kind of cliche. And when I think of what self-care means, it's not always the same as what other people think. I, th I think some people think getting a pedicure is self-care and maybe it is for them. But when you limit what self-care is and how it's defined to these kind of structured activities that involve money, you know, paying someone else to do something for you. Mm -hmm. Actually erase that <laughs> um, because paying someone else to do something for you is great. You're a massage therapist. <laughs> I support people hiring but, other but people to support their well-being. Exclusively. Exclusively. Yeah, if it's just I guess, that, that's the problem. Yeah. And, and I think the way that self-care is conceptualized is often this top-down approach. It's kind of this idea I should take care of myself. Hmm, what does that mean? Oh, well, BuzzFeed says it means I should get a pedicure or <laughs> listen to music. And it's not necessarily connected with how you're actually feeling mm -hmm. and what you're actually needing. So I prefer a bottom-up approach. I guess the way that I think of self-care is that we're reteaching ourselves how to feel and notice and respond to ourselves because most of us didn't have ideal parenting we didn't have the level of attention and emotional intelligence that would have really taught us 
a depth as well as breadth of understanding how to recognize our own physical, mental, and emotional signals and what those are telling us about what it is that we need. So I think of my work as a, as a therapist as sort of reparenting, helping people um, learn to reparent themselves mm. by becoming more self-responsive. And sometimes I adopt some of that role temporarily to help uh, my clients scaffold the development of self-parenting. And so that's kind of the theoretical foundation for this framework, it, combined with the understanding of nonviolent communication, some of the principles in nonviolent communication about, you know, understanding that all human behavior is a reflection of basic human needs and universal human feelings. So just kind of coming from that approach that this is really about understanding ourselves, attuning to ourselves, and then figuring out what we need. So I think self-care can mean a lot of different things, which is why I came up with these six pillars. We need different things at different times. And we need them on the levels of body, mind, and spirit, so to speak, um, relationally, socially as well. I kind of include that in the emotional part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but before I dive any further into the six pillars, because it sounded like you had some questions on yeah. that later, um, you asked, how, how am I? Yeah, what's in your toolkit? Mm -hmm. What are the things that you, if whatever you're willing yeah. you to share your whole self-care right. regimen. But like, yeah. I, I feel like maybe as a, a therapist that... Um, maybe you have a heightened awareness of mm. your self-care routine or mm -hmm. maybe you're considered a that you should be extra good at it and maybe <laughs> people would be surprised to realize that it's yeah. just as hard for you to it's like yeah people would think that i'm like so good at showing up for my own soft tissue self-care and foam rolling but i'm like i shirk it off as much yeah. as the next person right. often well, what's that saying the cobbler's kids don't have shoes uh, ah yeah. yeah so um I so hear let you me there. just make it clear that uh -huh. my own children do get regular body work. Okay. <laughs> good. Well, then, doing a good job as a parent. Um, and I don't think many kids get body work, so yeah. That's my a plus. my, my eight-year-old, he has no idea. He's like, "What do you mean other kids don't get massages every week?" Like, what? Oh, kid, you're spoiled. Oh man. Well, you're raising them right. They yeah. they won't need to teach themselves any of the self-care yeah. stuff as adults, like so many of us have had to. Um, so some of my current habits, I was thinking about that this morning and I actually pulled out my six pillars spreadsheet on the blank side and filled it in with, with what my self-care looks like currently. I think that the COVID pandemic has had a lot of obviously negative ramifications in many people's lives. I'm relatively fortunate in terms of how little it's affected me, but one of the benefits that I've personally experienced is that COVID has killed my FOMO. I no longer have fear of missing out on all the things happening in all the places because mm. they just aren't happening anymore, which has really provided an invitation and an opportunity to just have the best relationship with myself that I can. Um, so in some ways, the pandemic has really strengthened almost every aspect of my self-care except for the social part. So what that looks like for me lately... Um, you know, we got to start with the foundation of sleep and nourishment, right? So starting with rest and nourishment, which are the columns that I have on the left side of the page, getting eight hours of sleep is pretty essential for brain health and stress management. Eating well is something that I never compromise on. That doesn't mean that there's not room to be flexible when the situation calls for it, but I just think we have to start off with a good foundation of being nourished um, I also do a lot of kind of healing, relaxing stuff, especially this time of year when it comes to taking Epsom salt baths. And I think actually before we started recording, we were talking about doing float tanks, which I love. Those mm. are super grounding for the nervous system. I like being by the fire a lot during the winter. Um, so those are some of the foundational elements that are more in the categories of rest, nourishment, and grounding. Then when it comes to the mental side of things one of the techniques i use for mental grounding is bullet journaling i am mm. also a geek when it comes to the science of habit formation um what's bullet journaling bullet journaling just like, just like writing bullet points down and uh this is my bullet journal i have here and bullet journaling is a method of planning and organizing it's a strategy where all the things you might normally have in a lot of different note and calendar and journal systems can all be in one place. It's just a way of kind of self-organizing. Mm. I think it's really important in this day and age to have some analog systems in our lives, especially with COVID where even things that 
normally would have been face to face are online now. So we spend so much time on screens and I think we're all a little ADD as a result of all the screen time and that many of us haven't maintained or developed strategies for even organizing our thoughts without looking to a screen to tell us what to think, which can be very confusing. So I'm a fan of things that are analog, things that are physical and involve interaction with the world around us and our senses. So for me, bullet journaling or just having things on paper is an important strategy for making sure that I'm the one organizing my thoughts rather than that technology is telling me what I should be thinking or spending my time on. So I like the bullet journal method. Um, when it comes to mental grounding, um, like I said, some of the habit formation stuff that I like to geek out on. Um, I like to nourish and energize myself mentally through audiobooks and podcasts, mm. so learning. Um, I find gardening to be a grounding activity, um, physically and emotionally. Um, and fitness is important as well. Um, so fitness can give us physical energy, physical grounding. Um, it can also take care of us mentally and emotionally. So for example, um, I think of cardiovascular exercise mm -hmm. or dancing as things that give physical energy. I also think that strength training, physical therapy exercises, which is something I do, balancing practices and active range of motion exercises mm -hmm. for me fall into the category of being physically grounding. Mm -hmm. And I think that anytime we focus on any kind of physical fitness, we're getting mentally grounded as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be emotionally cleansing. Uh, well, that sounds like a really yeah. <laughs> broad toolkit. Do you have more to say about your uh, toolkit? Let's see what else is on my list. It's great. Um, most of the things that I have in the category of protection really come down to discernment. Um, so I actually have a few keywords for most of these categories. So for protection, I have safety, boundaries, and discernment. Um, for grounding, I have centering, orientation, and organization. Um, for energy and cleansing, I think expression can be a component of cleansing or energizing ourselves. Um, so when it comes to protection, I think the mental practice of discernment and the emotional practice of establishing boundaries in our relationships are really important for protecting ourselves and therefore protecting our ability to really engage in any of the other things. And I think right now with how much digital burnout I'm experiencing and anyone who's spending a lot of time on screens is experiencing, we're going through political burnout, we're going through a mental health crisis collectively right now. And so I think it's all the more important to have discernment about what we take in, who we interact with, where we give our energy to, and so forth. So when you think about all these things, when you're working with clients in particular, how do you do you have to conv how do you convince them to show up consistently for these things or do, or is it not a matter mm. of convincing is that a, is that the wrong mm. word or hmm. or maybe you could take this angle maybe think about yourself have there been times when you've dropped the ball on any one of these things and how do you shake yourself out of it how do you get <laughs> how do you get back to ba how do you get back to basics I mean, if this is about dropping balls, I would say I only recently really learned to juggle this many balls. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a very dynamic person. I tend to get spun out on a lot of different projects. I have my own ups and downs that I'm sensitive to, and that's why I've had to work so hard on making self-care a consistent practice, even though it's the form that it takes is going to be wildly inconsistent with the number of hobbies and interests that I have and the sure. way that my mind works. Um, so for me, I think how I feel is a guide and that's sort of a way that I encourage people to think about it is that you're learning to pay more attention to yourself mm -hmm. and some people might live at a constant state of anxiety or stress being at an eight out of 10, and they're just used to that. And so maybe the first step there is I help them feel what it's like to bring it down to a seven. I help them feel what it's like to bring it down to a six sometimes. And the more you get a felt experience in your own nervous system of what it's like to live at a better quality of well-being, the more you can kind of recalibrate and start setting the bar, let's say, lower on the stress scale or higher on the well-being scale, whatever measurement you want to use, and attuning to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't 
think there's any point in trying to force change all at once. I'm big on the science of habit formation and making change gradual and easy. And so I help people, I kind of normalize the process of what it looks like to shift your standard of well-being and shift your behavior. And you start with those little moments where you do something right for yourself. And then you kind of utilize your tendency. How do I say this? Utilize the brain's capacity for neuroplasticity Mm -hmm. to begin to adjust to having a new standard of well-being. And the closer you are to a healthy standard of well-being and the more familiar that feels in your own body, the more you start to notice when you're deviating from it. Mm. And the more options you have, if you work with me and you identify what your options are, the more you're able to kind of notice when you need to draw on those options. Um, Sometimes my work involves helping people with the mental component. Sometimes there are limiting beliefs about being unworthy or about what other people need from you or what the world needs from you or about what it would say about you if you were to treat yourself better. You know, there's all kinds of limiting beliefs that people have often from abusive or neglectful backgrounds that have implanted the mental piece of patterns of overwork and self-neglect and eventually self-medication as well. So sometimes my work as a therapist is more working on that mental piece. Um, I would say one place where it's easy for me to kind of get in and work with what's already on people's minds is that almost anyone coming to me for help wants to change something in their life. And maybe it's a pattern of self-medication, for instance, overeating or, you know, drinking in excess. Now, I'm not a drug and alcohol counselor, so if that's the main concern, I would refer to someone who specializes in that. But People are often very hard on themselves for, oh, I shouldn't eat so much. I should exercise more. I should try to be more social and not so afraid of people. I should this. I should that. Mm -hmm. I should clean my apartment. And whatever those should stories are, Mm -hmm. I kind of take this compassionate framework and shift the narrative like, well, let's explore what's driving that desire for change and what's holding it back. And oftentimes we find that these are the only coping mechanisms that they have. So for instance, someone who grew up in a really hostile environment and as a result developed a tendency to feel anxious and go inward with that anxiety, maybe to internalize shame. Uh, It might be that they've learned that the way to comfort and soothe themselves from that anxious state is to overeat, right? And then they come to me saying, I need to stop eating. I'm so bad. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, well, first of all, you're not bad. And second of all, wow, it sounds like eating is the only way you know how to soothe yourself right now. And um, there's a lot of reasons that you feel the frequent need for soothing. It sounds like maybe in your family, it wasn't safe to feel anger. It wasn't safe to feel sadness. It wasn't safe to feel anything other than anxiety. And food was the one way that you knew how to calm that. So rather than shaming and blaming and trying to control the one coping mechanism that you have, Let's work on making more space in your life for you to have more feelings and more attuned, appropriate responses to those feelings. If you need more help getting in touch with your anger, you need to make it safe for you to express your anger. And maybe when you're feeling that anger, you don't want to be soothed. Maybe you want to write down how you feel. Maybe you want to go for a run, you know? So Mm. it's not about controlling yourself and it's not about um there being any one right or wrong way it's that most of us need to relearn how to identify and respond to sensation wow (laughs) i might want to talk about the gestalt cycle of change if there's time for that because that relates let's let's go Mm -hmm. i don't i have no idea what that even is Okay. It's the particular tool from Gestalt therapy, or not even tool so much as um, framework for conceptualization that I want to use is something called the um, cycle of change or the cycle of needs. It's basically a way of understanding how things come into our awareness and how we respond to them. Hmm. So it begins with sensation. So I like to use the example of food because it's something that we all interact with every single day. 
And it's a way of understanding this in real practical terms. So the sensation could be hunger. Um, other sensations could include cold or heat or energy, right? So we start with a sensation of hunger. Then that sensation has to come into our conscious awareness. And some people get stuck right there, right? If there's been sufficient enough abuse or neglect, a person might disassociate so much that they're not aware of the sensations that mm. are in their body and mind, right? Uh, but hopefully, if if there's health, which we help me people move toward health sometimes, we go from sensation to awareness of sensation. Now, sometimes it stops there. What happens if you're aware of a sensation, but you don't know what to do with it? That could be anxiety provoking and <laughs> lead to all kinds of situations. But hopefully, uh, once you're aware of a sensation, you're also aware that there are options for how you respond to that sensation. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Gestalt, this is called mobilization. Um, that's one of the ways of thinking about it. But it basically means, okay, I'm aware that I have the sensation of hunger and now what do I do about it? So maybe this means I'm looking in the fridge. Maybe it means I'm looking for a restaurant or I'm planning a meal, but I'm doing something to look into what my options are. I'm going to drink water first to see if I'm actually hungry. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Verify that sensation. Um, so then we move into action. And, you know, in this case, okay, I'm preparing the meal. And then fulfillment, uh, I think it's called can't remember what it's actually called on the gestalt cycle but basically we move from taking action to fulfilling that need so that would be eating the meal and then hopefully we're satisfied so we go through the satisfaction stage and the withdrawal stage which is that sensation has been addressed that sensation is no longer in my conscious awareness and i'm moving on to whatever the next sensation the next awareness is yeah. Now, in Gestalt theory, a person could get stuck at any of these stages, and mm -hmm. those are called the interruptions, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, but I sometimes I spell out this cycle for my clients, and I use that example of food because it is so readily accessible. And then we look at how is this playing out in your life? Are you aware of what your body and mind are telling you? How do you interpret those sensations? Do you feel like you have resources and options? Do you have the mental ability or the support to find out what your options are and how to solve your problems? Mm. Do you have the courage to go for what you want and believe in yourself? Uh, do you have the ability to take something in that's good for you? Can you be receptive? Can you be satisfied rather than get stuck in egotism? Uh, can you let in and assimilate what's good for you so that you can can move forward and rich from the experience. And finally, do you know how to let go and move on? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know you're speaking to the audience, you, but I can't but help when thinking <laughs> like for, for me, I'm like, no, I get stuck <laughs> in all these things. <laughs> and then in my head, I was just like thinking, um, you're in this cycle in your example with the food, but then some other unrelated sensation happens simultaneously i would assume right that's life like some mm. other thing is going to come in so you're mm. playing this cycle out mm -hmm. while this one is beginning right that is sounds that... like adhd oh okay <laughs> but i mean no, you're I not, mean, that you're sounds not like just, life. just hungry you're mm -hmm. hungry and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think like well and if you're and hungry then, and you're also cold you're like, hungry cold you have to pee you're exhausted and your house is on fire yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, so probably start with a fire. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Well, actually, that that so that relates to another tool that I use. I'm kind of a psychology tool geek. So this one is um, simpler, but it's the Eisenhower decision matrix. Have you heard of it? No. Uh, it's basically a, a framework for understanding how we should prioritize decision making according to how important something is compared to how urgent it is. So in this framework, if something is both urgent and important, you have to deal with that first. It doesn't matter what else you were planning. If your house is on fire, that's where you start, mm. right? Those other urgent sensations, depending on, well, how hungry am I? How cold am I? How badly do I have to pee? How tired am I? Those things can rise to a level of urgency that demands immediate attention. So in life, we have to deal with the things that are urgent and important first, always. But hopefully, we're not always in crisis. And hopefully... We don't have to just react to everything that comes our way um, because to live a meaningful life, a healthy and sustainable life, 
we don't want to be in crisis mode. We want to be able to relax and we want to have the mental clarity to be able to focus on what's important. So things that are important would be, for instance, taking care of your health, planning your meals, keeping your home clean, maintaining your friendships and relationships, staying on top of payment bills. You know, the more you invest in those things that are important for your well-being, your relationships, your stability, the fewer crises emerge, right? So you're putting out fires by creating the conditions that the fires won't develop in the first place. Mm. So when you talk about oh, but there's so many sensations at once. It's, yeah, in the modern world, there are always so many sensations at once. Uh, We have to be able to filter out which of those sensations are, uh, I guess, sensations or stimuli are actually relevant. How urgent are they? Because things appear urgent when we have notifications going off. Um, There's a lot of things that are masquerading as urgent but aren't important. So it's really important to cultivate discernment and to have some planning tools for identifying what's important and how to devote appropriate time and energy towards making those investments in the things that are important and filtering out the distractions. Mm. So uh, if I may cycle back to um, habits, Mm -hmm. so I feel like you had some good, it seemed like you had some good things to say about habit building, habit I don't know. How, how do you think about habits and developing habits? Yeah, um, we could definitely do a whole episode on that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I love to geek out on those things, mostly because I am not by nature a creature of habit. I really have to train myself in habits. And um, I do now have some habits that uh, work pretty well for me because I have trained myself. Um, so my general approach to habit formation is to make it easy and gradual Um, So some kind of core concepts of habit formation are identifying our motives for wanting to engage in a certain habit or stop a certain quote unquote bad habit and uh, making sure that our reasons are attuned appropriately to our needs and our goals and then figuring out how to basically reduce friction toward achieving the desired habit and increase friction toward uh, doing the undesirable habit. Um, So you want to kind of streamline and structure your life in a way that makes it easy to do the thing that you want to do. You also want to make goals smaller so that you're training your brain that this is something I can do. This is something that fits into my life. So a few concepts that people can look into if they're interested in this further would be Elastic Habits. Um, There's a great video on Elastic Habits on the YouTube channel, Better Than Yesterday. There's also a whole book on it. The author's name is escaping me at the moment, so I apologize. I'll look it up. Okay. Um, So Elastic Habits is a great concept. Um, I like to use habit tracking, and there's ways to use that with the bullet journal method. There's also apps for people who prefer the technology route. Um, Habit stacking is another concept that I like to use. So it's basically taking the things that are already naturally occurring at the same time every day and just inserting a new habit in there. So for instance, people who are already in the habit of brushing their teeth first thing in the morning, if their doctor prescribes a new new medication, you know, put it by your toothbrush, start taking it then. That's kind of a a basic Mm. example of habit stacking, but there's all kinds of ways that we can take the things that are already routine and insert a desired habit into that stack. Um, So there's a lot more I could say on that, but... um, I think that's all I'll say for now, unless you have yeah. more questions about it. Well, I would just say, like, what is there any of those habits that you've built that you could take us oh, through? Oh, sure. Like, I don't know if there's um, a... Sure. Habits that I have built. Or we could take a generic one. Like, mm-hmm. I, I would like to, mm-hmm. to try and drink the proper amount of water. every. I never seem to f- fulfill mm. that one or, or I never go to bed. Either. I don't know. I, uh-huh. I'm failing all over the place here, Stephanie. Right. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so... There's a couple of things I could say about that. One is that for some reason that sensation isn't coming into awareness, right? The sensation of thirst isn't arising into awareness. So that's something I'd be curious about. Mm. Um, But let's talk about, okay, reducing friction um, towards drinking more water. That could look like having um, glasses or bottles or pitchers of water throughout your home and all the places that you normally work. You could have one right next to where you work in your massage studio. You could have one in the kitchen or in your bedroom. That's something that I do because I am big on drinking water. I'm also somebody who's just naturally thirsty, so I don't have to work on drinking water because my body tells me to. Mm -hmm. But as uh, someone who drinks a lot of water, 
I have pretty glass bottles that I keep everywhere. I have some by my bed. I have some by my desk. So again, you're just reducing friction. You're creating some of those structures that make it easy. Um, If it were a real struggle for you, and I don't think that that's probably an issue for you, but you could come up with a reward system (laughs) for, you know, and this is again, (laughs) self reparenting. I don't think that you need a reward system for drinking water, but. uh, Well, and that's a good, (laughs) because the reward is like built in. Yeah. Like I already know that I feel better when I do it. Right. Yeah. And ideally we're all that healthy and mature that we just operate based on intrinsic motivation all the time. But sometimes we have to give ourselves a little extrinsic motivation. And this is one of those places where working on ourselves um, kind of resembles self reparenting, right? Mm. Like as a parent, you probably use rewards to get your children to do desired behaviors. And a lot of people think it's silly, but it's really not that silly to you know, take advantage of the fact that we all are incentivized by rewards and disincentivized by punishments. Can you use that to your advantage? Absolutely. Um, it's I just think, hard to punish yourself. Yeah, I'm not big on punishment in general. It's like I, hard to follow through on something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people who are trying to make positive changes in their lives use a punitive approach and it's not helpful. It creates this kind of yo-yo effect, like dieting, right? People who shame themselves, uh, call themselves bad for what they eat. And I I keep using food today because it is just such a common example, right? I notice that anyone who has a shame-based or control-based relationship with anything they don't like about themselves, any habit they're trying to change, is that that you're going to make the pendulum swing. You know, you you go too far to one side with control and there's another part of you that doesn't want to be controlled. Story of my life. In Gestalt, <laughs> in Gestalt theory, this is uh, sometimes called top dog and underdog, right? Oh. The, or in psychodynamic theory, it would be the the id and the superego, right? The the control based part of us and the impulsive part of us. So I don't recommend anything that I think is going to intensify the swinging of that pendulum. Mm-hmm. Um, so most forms of self punishment are kind of that way. Um, However, rather than thinking, okay, so let's say that you thought that not allowing yourself to watch your favorite show was a form of punishment. Now you can reframe that to say, I reward myself for doing the things I say I'm going to do by watching the show. Now the structure is different, Mm. right? I don't take for granted that I can watch the show. I can watch the show as a reward to myself for having cleaned my living room and eaten my vegetables today, for yeah, instance, yeah. right? So rewards are usually more incentivizing, incentivizing than punishments. That being said- It still takes a little discipline though, right? Because it's easy to be like, well, I didn't eat the vegetables or clean the living room, but I'll just start. I'll try again tomorrow. And now I'll watch the show. <laughs> yeah, and that's where I think- it's important to be gentle with ourselves. Yeah. And as a therapist, I kind of gently, lovingly call people on their bullshit. Like I listen for those kind of self-deluding thoughts, the thought of how we, as some people call it, make excuses. I don't like the phrase make excuses because I think it's kind of punitive. But, you know, basically the lies we tell ourselves, the way we cheat ourselves out of success. And I think that rather than thinking of it as... Hmm. How do I put this? I guess I'll just say we all have our ways of lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I view it as my job to hold a mirror to that really lovingly. As in you're lying to yourself and you're the one who's suffering, right? Mm. So where did this voice in your head come from that you feel like you have to lie to? Is that the internalized voice of a shame-based parent or religion or something that you internalize that now you feel like you have to lie and hide from? Is that your superego? Is that your top dog that came from somewhere else? Because if so, let's have a conversation, um, maybe in therapy or in writing, a letter you never send to someone with that voice that you've internalized so you can have it out with that part of you that took on a shame-based form of control Mm. and then let's help you 
get to a point where you can catch up to your adult self and realize that your rebelliousness isn't actually telling anybody to screw off. You're not hurting the people who hurt you by rebelling against yourself. You're only hurting yourself, mm. right? Yeah, that, that makes all, all makes a lot of sense. Self-trust is important. And so that's a conversation I have with people sometimes, right? When you break your agreements towards yourself, you lack or you miss out on self-trust. And every time you keep an agreement with yourself, you're building your self-trust. And self-trust is a really important form of kind of like internal social capital that makes everything else possible. Having good self-trust is like having a good credit score. It's something you want to build. Yeah. And to go about building it, just following through on the things you're trying to, the habits you're trying to build. and the, Yeah. And yeah. that's one reason that I tell people it's so important to set realistic goals because it's S not even- wins kind of thing. Yeah. yeah because it's, it's just as much about your brain as it is anything that you're achieving or any changes you're making physically. It's about establishing that pattern that I do what I say I'm going to do. And so starting with a mini habit of every day I promise myself that I'll do one minute of jumping jacks. If you do that every day for 30 days as your exercise goal, you might be more successful than someone who is trying to run a marathon because mm. you're building self-trust and you're learning how much you can actually manage. And that way, when you're ready to take on more, you're going to be powerful. Yeah. That's so good. Okay. So we, we, we got to get into this a little bit. We have your framework, mm -hmm. matrix, if you will. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear you explain further about mm -hmm. where this came. So much, so much mm -hmm. of the we, we when we talked about at the beginning of the podcast about the 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 BuzzFeed sort of mm -hmm. pillars of healthcare frameworks, they're all mm -hmm. very much like the what what did you call the the mm -hmm. top down kind of thing? The, yeah, listicles. List yeah, listicles that tell you here are some ideas for something you could do for yourself and in these in these arbitrary mm -hmm. categories yeah and then but like i thought it was so funny when i when i looked it up there was like 20 well i mean there's probably hundreds but like the two pillars of self-care the three pillars of self-care the four the five you know like the eight the 20 like wow there was no mm -hmm. it was just like who whatever author decided to like Mm. write it just just kind of like i i can think of three off the top of my head so that's mm. what i'm going to put in this buzzfeed article mm. but so i'd be be curious to say just to hear how you arrived at these categories and if you could describe i mean we'll we'll link to it so that people can can find a copy and look at it but yours plays um the physical mental emotional and spiritual needs am i using the right words a sure. against these other I don't, I don't want to miscategorize them. I'll let you speak because you uh, created it. Sure. I mean. Hey, this is Nick breaking into the episode really quick just to say that at this point, Stephanie begins speaking specifically about the resource she created, her six pillars of self-care framework. And we I didn't really introduce it at the time. So it might be helpful if you're if you're listening. If you wanted to follow along, you can find a link to that resource so you can see it for yourself as she speaks about it. There's a link in the show notes. So let's get back to it. Yeah, these are just ways of conceptualizing the components of what it is to take care of ourselves. So um, going along the top row, we have the categories of rest, nourishment, cleansing, grounding, energy, and protection. And then we have this, as you were saying, sort of played against the um, four dimensions of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So those form a grid where we have, for instance, physical rest and mental energy. Um, one of the ways I like to use this is to help people do a self-care inventory. Uh, there's some examples on one side and it's blank on the other. And the examples are really just there to help people draw from them if they want. Uh, but Sometimes people find that filling this out that they've been really focused on certain areas of life and not others, mm -hmm. and this helps them kind of recognize what's missing and how to respond to um, those areas of life as well. So um, sort of one at a time, rest, 
is pretty straightforward, right? So physically, we need sleep. Um, we also need mental, emotional, and spiritual rest. So mental rest can look like taking a break from overstimulation. For some people, that might mean meditation or any kind of practices that still and calm the mind, focusing on the breath, or even just listening to relaxing music. Um, emotional rest can mean that we're paying attention to any signs of burnout or noticing if relationships or emotionally impactful activities are taking a toll on us, then we need to figure out what it is to let our heart rest. Um, so sometimes that just means taking space from other people. Um, spiritual rest, depending on a person's, hold on, let me just adjust this. Um, so spiritual rest, depending on a person's spiritual orientation. And I really wrote this as sort of something that anybody of any spiritual tradition could, uh, utilize for themselves. So, um, things like meditation, daydreaming, the serenity prayer, or visiting places that feel like a sanctuary could be a form of spiritual rest mm -hmm. for some people or meditation retreat. Uh, then moving on to nourishment. So on the physical level, we need to eat healthy foods and drink water and take any supplements that our bodies might need. Of course, that's all pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And then we want to take in that physical nourishment in a good way. So in a way that's unhurried, in a calm environment and so forth. Um, sometimes other practices besides food are physically nourishing. So you're a massage therapist. I'm sure that receiving a massage can be a very nourishing experience mm -hmm. for people as well. And even things like uh, oiling or moisturizing the skin mm -hmm. can give us physical nourishment. As well as taking in other things through our senses, um, touching things that feel good to our senses, um, fragrances, and uh, really any of the senses can give us nourishment. Uh, mental nourishment, uh, so anything that strengthens our mind and intellect. I gave some examples on the handout of reading a book, watching a documentary, taking a class, studying a new language or instrument, or doing any kind of brain training exercises or games. Um, then for emotional nourishment, um, spending time around people who feel good for your heart, good friends, a cherished pet, soothing touch, face-to-face uh, -face contact, and positive affirmations are some of the things that I have listed on the handout uh, as far as emotional nourishment goes. And looking at this, I think about how much emotional nourishment is lacking from so many of our lives right now due mm. to the COVID pandemic. Um, so let me just think on that for a moment because uh, I know your podcast will probably exist beyond the pandemic, but for the foreseeable future, we're in this situation. So I'd love to offer some reflections on emotional nourishment. Um, it might sound overly simplistic, but for people who haven't had healthy relationships or haven't had healthy relationships modeled for them, I think even watching heartwarming television can be a form of emotional nourishment. Mm. If you're, you know, I like to recommend shows like um, Parenthood. I don't know. Have you ever seen that show? Yeah, um, only an episode or two. Okay. I just finished Shit's Creek. So oh. good. That was emotionally <laughs> nourishing for me. Okay. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. Like laughter, right? Um, but yeah. That show also has a lot of heart. I really? can't recommend it highly enough. Okay. Yeah, I never so got good. into it. I just, yeah. the, the, the wealthy family trope was just so dramatic to me. Oh, I got yeah. Sick you got to get so it anyway. Yeah. I know people People have shows that they swear by. And yeah, yeah. Like, oh, you just got to get past the first season and the second season. Yeah. <laughs> like, eh, I don't have time for That's that. That's a lot of seasons. Um, yeah. yeah. But uh, like, I give the example of the show Parenthood because. I think that it's a, a really well-written, emotionally intelligent show that depicts human relationships that have a healthy balance of rupture and repair, which is a psychotherapeutic concept. I'll just kind of liken it for a moment to how we strengthen muscles through these tiny tears when we work out. And um, emotional relationships are like that too. Those little moments of, of disconnection or hurt, if we respond to them in the right way, can actually strengthen a relationship. So I think that the show Parenthood does a really good job of depicting that and can be really heartwarming. So um, even for people who are alone and don't have any resources, uh, you can provide yourself with emotional nourishment. Yeah. 
emotional nourishment <laughs> by taking in things that nourish you with good examples of the kinds of emotions that you want to cultivate in your life. I'm going to shout out a uh, in this regard on TikTok. There's a whole like subculture meme of um, it's like soldiers coming home and surprising their like kids. Mm, mm-hmm. It's so heartwarming. Mm-hmm. I, there's I could watch those. Over there you and over go. Again. Yeah, <laughs> you know it reminds me actually of um, a time I was at my former job at the Native American Rehabilitation Association, and my boss was so stressed out, and I just had the impulse to say you need to watch puppies and babies and i just pulled up youtube and i just showed her a minute of puppy and baby videos and (laughs) it was like yes that was what was called for and and that's emotional nourishment so if you don't have your own pet or kid or whatever you can boost your oxytocin levels just by looking at someone else's (laughs) okay um spiritual nourishment some of the examples that i gave here on the sheet are um, reading scripture or spiritual literature of your choosing Um, finding a mentor, joining a congregation, 12-step group, or other spiritual community. Moving on to cleansing. Um, So when it comes to cleansing, I think of cleansing as anything that um, sheds, gets rid of, eliminates, uh, clarifies, or uh, perhaps expresses as needed. So on the level of physical cleansing, of course, we have basic hygiene, bathing and showering and so forth. Some people also like to do detoxifying activities, whether that's something that detoxifies your skin or, um, you know, doing something like the Whole30 or a cleanse. I'm not big on fasting personally, but um, things that help your body to release toxins or taking a break from alcohol, sugar, and other things that make your body feel weighed down and icky. That could be a form of physical cleansing, um, as well as cleaning your home, uh, cleaning out your belongings, and so forth. Mental cleansing, similar to mental rest in some point, in some ways, just giving your mind a break. So here I have meditation and breath work. Um, Things that help you enter a flow state can be very mentally Mm. cleansing, as well as taking a digital detox. So when when it comes to the flow state, for instance, I used to be involved in a musical practice, a music meditation, in which I was a drummer. And the drum that I played involved both hands making different rhythmic patterns, which is something that requires intense concentration. Yeah. And it was really excellent for entering a trance state where I was so aware of the music and so aware of what my body was doing. And... I remember just feeling coming out of those experiences like someone had pushed the reset button in my brain because for an hour or two, there'd been nothing else in my awareness besides the rhythm that I was keeping. Um, So anything that helps you enter a flow state um, that requires coordination of the limbs, for instance, uh, can help with that. Like rock climbing, that's not something that I do, but rock climbing is really good because it forces you to be very much in the moment, figuring out what all of your body is doing at the same time. Same thing if you take a more advanced Hatha Yoga Vinyasa flow class where in every moment you have to focus on your proprioception. Uh, Any of those kinds of practices that help you enter a flow state can be really mentally cleansing. You'll find Mm -hmm. afterward like, oh, I just spent an hour or two not thinking about everything that I've been thinking about the rest of the week. Excuse me. Um, also taking a digital detox is a form of mental cleansing Mm. that I think most of us do not do enough. Um, if you want more resources on that, there's a cute handy little book called how to break up with your phone that I recommend. All right. Um, emotional cleansing. So here I have examples, including grieving, crying, um, writing an angry letter, then shredding or burning it or reading it to your therapist. <laughs> uh, for people who menstruate, uh, menstruation can feel emotionally cleansing. So I work with some of my female clients on kind of learning to work with their cycle so that um, just kind of paying attention to how emotions build up through the month and how to work with their cycle to um, release those emotions. Um, sweating can be emotionally cleansing Hmm. um and purging things that have emotional weight to them you know uh, 
belonging that was given to you by an ex and every time you look at it you feel sad well maybe you don't need to keep that anymore yeah and then spiritual cleansing i have uh some ideas here from various cultures such as participating in sweat lodges which are native american spiritual practice um smudging incense uh spritzes and other aromatics so some people use um burning things or holy water or things like that to purify their spaces spiritually um grieving rituals uh that's something i think we don't have nearly enough of in our culture mm. because we have a very repressed and distorted relationship with death i once had the opportunity to participate in an african grieving ritual and that was very powerful i think it was from the dagara tradition but i'm not 100 percent sure so don't quote me on that i apologize if i am disrespecting anybody's culture by not remembering what i'm talking about right now <laughs> but i do remember that um it was beautiful and powerful to be in a ritual where space was intentionally being created and held for people to express their grief mm. and there were people wailing and sobbing and others who were there to support them all in a circle um i think we need more things like that mm. and it's it's very spiritually cleansing um also making amends and asking forgiveness i think that asking forgiveness is a powerful practice if done right I've definitely heard of people asking for forgiveness in a way that was kind of selfish or immature, like, please forgive me, as in, like, I want something from you, so can mm. you just get over this thing that's stopping you from giving it to me? And that's not what I mean when I say asking forgiveness. I mean really, like, purifying your own heart by showing another person or expressing to another person, I see what I've done to cause harm, and I apologize, and will you forgive me as a way of releasing the past and giving yourself permission to move on because some people carry a lot of guilt and shame and so you know it's it's okay to grow in life mm -hmm. it's okay to learn and change and look back and say wow i really would have handled this differently now so i think it's okay to uh honor and acknowledge that and sometimes we need to ask for forgiveness and and relieve ourselves of that burden yeah do you want me to keep going through the pillars yeah well okay. so we, we, we just finished cleansing right mm-hmm yeah, I think we can get through this. Mm -hmm. Grounding. The grounding. We start with okay. physical grounding. Yeah. Um, so as I look at this sheet, some of the examples that I provided for physical grounding here, uh, I would also say are mentally grounding. Um, on my latest version of filling this out for myself just this morning in preparation for our conversation, some of the things that I identified are physically grounding include physical touch. Um, and I think I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, Physical practices that can be grounding include strength training, physical therapy, balancing exercises, and active range of motion exercises. So I find that those things really bring me into my body in a calm way um, and help me feel more centered. Uh, but also here I have following daily routines. Um, and it's really simple, but even just putting, you know, getting dressed, packing your belongings, organizing your home um, are things that can be grounding. And then connecting with nature, especially if you have the opportunity to feel your bare feet on soil, grass, or sand, that mm. can uh, be very grounding as well. Mental grounding as well, some of those physical things like organizing your belongings and preparing for your day, uh, planning your day, setting intentions, making lists. Again, I'm a fan of bullet journaling. Um, and uh, also I have on here paying attention to your surroundings. So. That's something that we use in trauma therapy. So for instance, if someone has PTSD and something's come up that's triggered a dissociative reaction or a flashback for them, uh, one of the mental grounding techniques that can help bring someone into the present moment is to pay attention to their five senses. So an example of that could be, what's your favorite color? Purple. Okay. Can you look around the, wor uh, around the room and count all the purple things? Oh, there's a purple pillow over there. And Okay, right? So mm -hmm. that can be a mental grounding practice, um, paying attention to what sounds can you hear? Oh, I can hear the humming of the refrigerator. Um, so there's a 54321 sense practice that people can mm. look up if they're interested in more information about that. Um, so that's mental grounding. Mm -hmm. All right, emotional grounding. Also, the five senses can be helpful for emotionally grounding ourselves. Um, 
I have on here the example of looking at old photos or other memorabilia to remind you of who you are. So I think um, sometimes we get lost and we forget who we are. We forget who we're connected to or what we're a part of that gives us emotional grounding. So um, for me personally, I don't have a very good memory, but I am someone who tends to collect items that friends give me. So when I look around my home, I see, oh, my friend gave me this rock and my other friend mm. gave me this scarf and it just reminds me of who I am and how I'm connected to people. I also have on here playing an instrument, um, writing a song, singing, making art, uh, and working with clay. thats It's a very sensory um, mm. type of artistic activity. Yeah. Spiritual grounding. I have here rites of passage. Uh, the reason that I put rites of passage as something that's spiritually grounding is because it grounds our growth in time and place, right? When we have a rite of passage, we're stopping to acknowledge where we are in time and space spiritually. Yeah. Um, I had that recently on a solo camping trip this summer where I just kind of grounded myself spiritually looking out at this lake by myself, just reflecting on how time has passed and how I've matured and reckoning with myself. Um, mm. Rites of passage are generally missing from our culture, but we know in Native cultures there have been um you know coming of age ceremonies in mexican culture there's quinceañeras in jewish culture there are bar and bat mitzvahs um weddings funerals and other ceremonies are all types of rites of passage acknowledging transitions um affirmations are also something that can be spiritually grounding right especially for people who tend to get confused easily and i even use this with someone who has pretty severe schizophrenia who i work with um just well, thinking about, okay, well, what do you actually believe mm. <laughs> spiritually that's good for you and that helps you feel centered and, all right, let's write that down. Let's put it on the bathroom mirror if you need to look at that every day to ground yourself. Mm. Connecting with the elements, um, honoring the passage of time. And I put here celebrating holidays, season cycles, births and deaths, kind of same as rites of passage. All right, moving on to energy. Um, and I, I think... And you know, we have to at least have, have some rest, nourishment, and grounding before we have the resources to have energy. Yeah. So when it comes to physical energy, um, stimulants are an obvious source. Uh, I have <laughs> coffee and tea. Uh, exercise, fresh air, sunshine, um, things like Tai Chi and Qigong that work with and cultivate energy. Um, also before the podcast, we were talking about Kundalini and um for people who are interested in that, practices that cultivate kundalini, as well as safe caring sex can also be energizing. Uh, mental energy, so inspiring conversations, learning new things, traveling, looking at art, finding meaningful work. So basically inspiring and refreshing uh, and energizing our mind and intellect. Mm -hmm. Emotional energy, um, kind of similar to emotional nourishment, what makes you happy, right? So what kind of people make you happy? What do you find funny? What helps you um, find play and silliness and humor in life? Um, listening to music and dancing can be emotionally energizing. Playing a sport or game, giving to others and being of service. Those are all some examples that I have. Mm. Um, and then spiritual energy. Uh, so again, when it comes to energy, inspiration is one of those words that comes to mind. So here for spiritual energy, I have looking up at the stars, uh, pilgrimage or travel to things that inspire you and anything related to finding and cultivating your sense of purpose, meaning, or direction in life. Okay. And finally, last but not last least. Last column. Yes. We're on to protection. And I will say- I, but it's, By the way, I didn't, I didn't necessarily intend for you to go through all this, but I really appreciate oh, okay. that you are. I think it's amazing. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And stop me at any point. No, no, no. You're okay. good. We, we're on protection. We're good. Yeah. All right. So- Protection was the last one that I added. I actually had it as the five pillars for a while. And then it, at some point it came up that I, I realized that protection was missing here. Mm. So on the level of physical protection, things that keep you physically safe, like knowing self-defense, keeping doors locked, knowing your surroundings, having backup plans and emergency kits, carrying pepper spray, um, having insurance and wearing sunscreen. Those are all kind of basic but powerful things you can do to ensure your physical safety. Um, mental protection, 
I have here, for example, avoiding bad news. Now, sometimes you want to take in the news, right? So this is just about having discernment about when is enough enough. Mm. So there are times that we maybe recognize the need to protect our mind if we're in a particularly fragile time and space and that's when it's important to have more discernment about like for example 2020 yeah exactly <laughs> let's all just bury our head in the sand because we've had a decade's worth of drama already um <laughs> okay so <laughs> emotional protection similarly you know having discernment about who you give your time and energy to what you let in um so setting boundaries picking your friends Saying no, taking it slow and getting to know someone new. Um, I, I put here having your friends and I would add family, vet your partners so that other people are helping with your discernment and protection mm. um, and staying connected to people who really know you and care. And finally, last but not least, spiritual protection. Um, some examples that I gave here. Again, this is really going to vary depending on someone's spiritual orientation, but some people find that they feel spiritually protected by carrying an object like a, a talisman or something that someone gave to you that signifies their their presence is with you and some people believe in things like protection prayers and rituals hmm. so that's what i got on the uh, sheet and we actually went through so all amazing little boxes <laughs> so so when when someone looks at this i mean you you like for them to fill out get specific with each one you know like mm -hmm. if for example they're saying like um when it comes to having your friends vet or your partner, you might write the name of the friends down that you are going to sure. meet with your, or you know, just like being clear about what the things are. And then like, and so because it comes with all these examples and the other side is blank, people can start with the, they can either look at your examples or start mm -hmm. with the blank side and mm -hmm. just see how they think about emotional grounding and what mm -hmm. comes up for them right and then mm -hmm. just write an example there and yeah yeah uh, there is some overlap for like some people might think someone's emotional cleansing might be someone else's emotional energy yeah like there's a little bit of play there yeah, yeah. there's uh, really nothing strict about this framework it's just for it's just for ideas you know yeah i, well, I think it's a, a much more helpful way to think about these things than the typical BuzzFeed article. So thank you for creating <laughs> this. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast to talk about it. I really appreciate you being here. It's been great to be here. And there you have it. I can't thank Stephanie Wynn enough for joining me on the podcast today. You can find links to many of the things we spoke about in the show notes. You can find Stephanie on Instagram at Real Talk Therapy PDX. You can find her website, realtalktherapypdx.com, where she has an exhaustive list of very useful resources, things like ADHD, mood disorders, relationships, all sorts of things related to mental health. Very exhaustive resource. I encourage you to check it out. Until next time, be well.